actually come along. Uh, but fortunately, we've got technology in theory. <laughs> Uh, I try and record as many of these and put them online so other people can can uh, get get the essence of of what was being shared. Um, so tonight I'm going to be walking through uh, a lot of the thinking that, that's happened. Over the years, I've been very interested in mental health. Uh, it's it's very personal. It's uh, also now active, and a uh, strange thing happened. I was invited to be a part of a master's course at Queen Margaret Uni, and uh, it's it's the first course of its kind at master's level. Uh, and it's called uh, mass, uh, Mad Studies. <laughs> and the, I, I like David Ravel's uh, explanation of this. Um, he, he was very involved in Canada in, in talking about this and in, in consolidating as a, a topic. And uh, he... In, in his uh, video, uh, An Introduction to Mad Studies, which is on YouTube, um, he described it as, um, so the, he uses a painting of Charcot, a famous physician, with, uh, you, you see a woman swooning, and he's talking to a group of uh, white men and saying, ah, oh, well, see, this is a hysterical woman. <laughs> and he says that this it, it, it shifts the interest the, 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 the locus of the knowledge from the physician to the person where the, the medic's attentions are being focused on so what, what was this woman's experience of being brought into this theatre why, why had she been identified as Mad or with a psychiatric label, um, and many questions on from that. Um, and part of the the course has been public sociology, uh, and we're now working through that. And so the presentation tonight is part of my examinations of the sociology of psychiatry, of psychiatric labels. Uh, and these labels, these identities that people are given, are, are very powerful. They, they, they change how the world behaves towards the individuals. Um, and public sociology, uh, I guess it's, oh, let's move. So uh, the, the themes that are being covered tonight, uh, and I'm going to do, do this as, as uh, sensitively as possible because we're going to be covering some strong meats, as they say, you know, some strong subjects. And what, what's very important to me is that these histories and the people who these histories connect with um, are respected and uh, it, it's done sensitively. Um, I'm going to be going through how psychiatric labels have been used in the USSR specifically, um, how psychiatric labels have been used in the, UG, uh, the LGBTQ population, how psychiatric labels have been used on single mothers how psychiatric labels have been used on inconvenient family members. Uh, and then we're going to have a bit of a, a, a break. <laughs> so you, uh, and, and you can come and go as you please. <laughs> and then I'm going to walk through a history that I found out about Rosemary Kennedy. She's the eldest sister of John F. Kennedy. 
uh, and when I discovered her, her, her story and started to dig into the history, uh, I, I, I found it was a really great, great case study for the sociology of psychiatry and how these sociological, what I'm calling sociological cascades, amounted to, at the age of 23, this young woman being lobotomized. Now, yes, yeah, uh, and I want it to be conversational, so if, if you have thoughts or you want clarifications, uh, please just, just chip in. Um, so I, I've mentioned the, the, the Masters in Math Studies. I think it's a really important development. Uh, I think it, it, it feels like the kind of critical thinking that gave rise to uh, the likes of philosophical movements like feminism. Um, and we, we, I feel personally, we, we culturally need to examine psychiatry and how it's manifesting in the, in the world, globally. Public sociology um, has many things in common with action research. And uh, I, I would say that public sociology is to sociology what action research is to research. <laughs> what is action research? Yes, well, it acknowledges that research is not value neutral. That we, you know, whoever we are, we're, we're carrying our, our, our life experience, the, the things we already know, to a subject area. Um, it respects the research, researcher and the participant, participants are equal in co-producing knowledge. Um, it aims to bring about constructive change. So, so it, uh, it, it is about aiming to bring positive change in the world. Um, and it makes sure that a cent uh, at the center of this process, a dialogue between the concrete and the abstract in terms of knowledge is, is being held. So um, if I say, the term schizophrenia. That's, that's abstract, it's marvelously abstract, and huge, diversely used word. Um, what was the, what, what was actual experience? What, what's the experience of that in the world? Um, so, yes, I'll, I'll now, I had hoped to um, play this little video, but I've forgotten to bring the little digital doodah that allowed me to plug in sound. I'll describe what this video is, and I'll provide a link uh, on the website. So this, this uh, I'm very interested in Gregory Bateson, and for those who don't know Gregory Bateson, he was a systems thinker and a, a cyberneticist. And at a certain point, he and his colleagues turned their attention to thinking about what uh, madness is, what, what psychiatric labels are. And for me, he, they, they bring some really valuable insights. And his daughter, Nora Bates, uh, brought, uh, continues to bring people together around how we understand systems. And I think systems thinking is increasingly impor important, not to think about a single aspect of our world, but how those aspects we're interested in are 
connected with other things. And uh, Gregory Bateson spoke, uh, they, they, they defined this as the double bind. The double bind is very important to look for. It's a situation. Thank you. <laughs> Where I, I guess it's a no win situation. If I go left, I'm criticized. If I go right, I'm criticized. And that pr produces uh, a remarkable psychological load on the individual. And their, the way they're thinking and the way they're feeling and the way they're behaving becomes affected. And it's only a five minute video, but what I really liked about this particular video is there's a gentleman who had been suffering great mental anxiety, who was a, a fellow academic with Gregory Bateson, and how Gregory Bateson's uh, analysis helped him find happiness and uh, alleviate that mental ailment, that mental distress. Uh, and he showed how he was in a double bind, both with his family, but also with the institutional response to his psychological distress. And he pointed out that, well, it's not a change in the system that, that is needed, it's a change of the system. So he found that he, he was reconstituted when he, he moved himself into uh, what, what was ultimately a more healthy environment. So, I, I think, uh, so if, if we're thinking about what, what sociology is, sociology is a study of human society which focuses on societal structures, human social behavior, patterns of social relationships, social interactions, and aspects of culture associated with everyday life. And I would argue that we can only understand the individual also by understanding the context in which they exist. So again, going back to Gregory Bateson, thinking about the system, and I've been listening more and more to Fritjof Capra, who uh, is, a, is a great systems thinker. And we have to think, expand our awareness, our consciousness more and more to be polymathic, to take, in, to take an interest in all things, because all things have a bearing on the thing that we're, we're looking at or thinking about. So, what happens when you cut down all the trees and get rid of all the green spaces for a species that co-evolved with trees and green spaces over 50 million years? A level of distress happens and we can measure that with how many stress hormones are produced. And those stress hormones have a very powerful impact for our well-being. And we can only understand parts of other, other people's existence by listening to and valuing what they say about their experience. There's a lovely example um, where they're of a mining village and the, the, the wives of the miners went to the owners of the mine and said, you have to pull the miners out. There's going to be a collapse. And they said, what do you know? And they said, well, we know because we know the quality of the coal. And more coal dust is coming out in our washes. We're washing our clothes. That tells us the, the scene they're working in doesn't have the same integrity, the structural integrity, 
this is bad. Now, they were ignored. And there was a collapse and many people's lives were lost. So the important, maybe they didn't have the, the academic language, the formal language to say, geologically, <laughs> here is our report. But they had knowledge that had every characteristic of knowingness. Sorry, could I ask where that mind was? Um, I can give you the reference for it. Yeah, I love it. Um, but I can bring it to mind at the moment. No it's, it, uh, I will send you the reference to it okay. because it's in a, a, a great book on sustainability thinking and education uh, published by Routledge. Okay, cool. So um, my e email, just if you don't... Uh, I, will, I can chat to you about it. Yeah, Probably please. No worries. Yeah, uh, thanks, that's the, the good thing is, I should be able to bring uh, an account of where I'm getting all the things I'm saying. And part of my learning, I'm here to learn. And it's great to have people to help see my blind spots and pick up on aspects that I've not thought about. Um, so... Medicine and society can only learn and evolve through acknowledging the uncomfortable problems and critique that exists. Uh, as Eirik Skandrit said yesterday, expertise, well, people need expertise, but expertise needs critique to be successful. So this brings me on to this interesting publication. <laughs> uh, and John Duradini and Lehman McHenry have written this book, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. Now they're not saying science is a fiction. They are saying we have gone through the court transcripts where multinational companies, medical, pharma, pharmacological companies, uh, have been taken into court. And we were trying to figure out how they've come to the decision that X, Y, or Z is good for treating X, Y, or Z. You know? um, and uh, I was introduced to this book, and it's really well, it, it, it's powerful because they are arguing for a return to science and a move away from non-transparency. And to, to set a background, um, So I, I brought this quote from the, the YouTube video of where um, uh, Philip Alston is talking through uh, human rights and do, do human rights investigations matter? Now he was the, the special rapporteur for the United Nations on extreme poverty. And he came to Britain because he was told, well, you, you don't need to bother about Britain. <laughs> There's no poverty here. <laughs> and uh, he, he was told, don't mention human rights. Now, historically, Britain's um, philosophically averse to the notion of human rights. Uh, in polit uh, political philosophy, you will find that we've got a situation where um, anthropologically our rights are alienated from us and the, historically the monarch looks after all of our interests. Isn't that nice? And then you've got philosophers like John Locke who published a counterpoint to this 
and said, well, you can't alienate human rights. Even if somebody writes a contract and says, I will work these uh, conditions that will cause my health to suffer, that contract is invalid. And it's very powerful to see uh, this, the, the most cited human rights scholar say, well, poverty is a political decision. And that uh, these very wealthy economies have made a deliberate decision to keep 15% or so of its population in chronic poverty. I, I feel this has a profound bearing on how people are feeling, how people are thinking, and how their behavior, you know, how our, our cognition to live without sufficient foods our sufficient heat, uh, sufficient social environments, it affects us. Are you saying a maximum of 15% or <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just an unacceptable level? I, 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 he, he said uh, 50, this, this, this is a verbatim quote from the, the video, mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm conservatively saying up to 15. Let, let's be super conservative and go 10%. So one in 10 people, or you know, even if we go to 5%, is it acceptable to us that one in 20 people is in chronic and dire poverty? And what are the effects on people's health? So Sir Michael Marmot has longitudinally reviewed the effects of uh, poverty and being low down in social hierarchies. And he's shown that people have worse health and have shorter lives. And he's repeated this decade after decade after decade. He's got a very interesting report on um, life uh, uh, affected by COVID. Um, so Michael Marmot, uh, Phil Alstom, they're, they're well worth looking up. You may have heard of uh, the spirit level, Wilkinson Pickett. They carry on from the, the Whitehall studies that Marmot did. Uh, I mean, these are huge studies. These are not, not just large numbers of people, but they are also um, longitudinal. Uh, and it's just, there's, there's rarely funding to do that. But uh, Wilkinson Pickett and their spirit level um, pick up and carry this forward as well. So th in this context, I, I argue sh human rights are, do matter to our psychological well-being. Uh, and um, I, I suspect that where people's psychological well-being is affected, their mental well-being is affected, it's, it's a marker of a human rights violation. Another theme I'm bringing in is the theme of social contagion. So social contagion is the spread of emotions or behaviours from one individual to another without awareness. Uh, uh, even though I'm a multi-millionaire, I like to, uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that has a psychological impact on, on people. It, it, can, it can affect people and, and it can do the rounds socially. This person is this. Um, those kind of statements I'm increasingly interested in. So I'm looking at thinkers like Norbert Elias, a sociologist who in part looked at gossip. Praise gossip, blame gossip. That's a good person, that's a bad person. Somebody who has no knowledge of a person might meet them 
and treat them totally differently. This person is, is mad. You know, these, these psychiatric labels can function as a social contagion and affect how the world around them responds to them. Social contagion processes become problematic when they lead, lead to spates of aggressive or self-injurious behaviours. Uh, an example of social contagion is the 1962 June bug, when workers <laughs> developed all the same psychologically induced symptoms. Um, so, <laughs> so, what happened in 1962? Um, this, I, I've not gone into that history, but uh, uh, I, if, if we think about, I can talk about, for example, the witch hunts. Um, uh, Arthur Miller's play, The, the Crucible, was about how, oh, well, they're, they're possessed by the devil. Let's, let, let's burn them. Uh, and then people started confessing. Uh, Aldous Huxley wrote The Devils of Loudin about certain amounts of social contagion. The, 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 the religious fevers that resulted in collective actions that, that were led to atrocities. Um, I, I was looking for a definition and I, I this is where I lift the, def the definition of psychology today. Mm -hmm. um, so you had about the town in America that all developed Tourette's over the course of two or three months or something. Oh, okay. yes. no. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you much more than that. I, know that's the headline. Well, that, I mean, that's a really nice example of kind of social contagion of a strictly psychological disorder, right? Yeah. There's I've been umpteen examples of hysterical illnesses yes, yes. through the through history. They happen quite frequently. Most commonly, actually, they happen in female students or yes, female yes. Uh, school children. Yes. They're the most common target of that. They all yes. develop the same illness. No symptoms or anything, and it turns out to be psychologically based. Mm -hmm. My favourite is the dancing plague of 1518. <laughs> 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 people just don't own music, like up to 400 people just dance for about a month. <laughs> and these things, they, 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 you know, we're empathic, you know, by and large. So it's a, it's a, it's, there, there's a certain level of uh, not. It's certain, you know, certain naturality to mirror. And I, I'm really interested in uh, Professor Arthur J. Dykeman's work on cult behaviours that we find in everyday society. Um, according to this, in the month of June 1962, a number of workers in the textile mill became victims of a mysterious sickness. The reported symptoms included nausea and breaking out all over the body, so presumably oils or something. Thought to be due to the presence of some strange insect in the workroom of the plant. As the matter was investigated by health authorities and entomologists, it became increasingly apparent that there was no realistic basis for the epidemic, and the case was one of hysterical contagion. So we're not basically saying that because a few folk thought this was happening, that other folk thought it as well. But they must have actually been getting physical symptoms. She can't have just been, no, I don't think I feel well. I mean, according to this, it would suggest that other people were actually getting these so-called breakouts because they expected to get them. Well, a bit strange. Well, that's quite likely because, in fact, I mean, a lot of stress, for example, actually causes changes in the skin and changes mm -hmm. in gland yeah. function, yeah. changes yeah. in body function, mm -hmm. which then produce exactly these kinds of symptoms. People say, Oh, look, you know, I've got a rash, mm -hmm. but the rash is not being caused by something that is a contagious disease, 
it's going to be caused by the changes in the body as a result of the stress and anxiety. I'm just thinking about the patients now. I get another. Yeah, so, the, the, I mean, you're raising a really good point, the, the relationship between the non-material and the material. And, and that, that's something I'm trying to reconcile through thinking and research. Um, so, uh, and, and a, lar a large part of my time has been looking at the effect of stress hormones. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I'll refer again back to um, Michael Marmot's work because it's so accessible and it's so w well scrutinized. The psychological environments, the sociological environments we're, we're exposed to have a direct bearing on our physicality. That's just actually children. You know, if you look at ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, that translates into physical uh, problems. Lots. I mean, that's well, very well researched, so that's not new. But Oh, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not, no, no, <laughs> not, not no, suggesting I'm, I'm no, 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 but I mean, it's, is, is there, is there a question about social contagion then? That, that don't people accept that it exists and that it could be, uh, altered? I think there are, there are, like, prominent, uh, perspectives that, that question the idea that our materiality can, you know, be affected, uh, that, uh, uh, have you heard of the secret? No. <laughs> Is it? We'll hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's heavily marketed. It, uh, it, it's a, a perspective that, that's sold by life gurus, certain life gurus, and they say, "Well, you know, it's all in the mind, and if you've got the right mental state, the right spiritual state." Everything you want will come to you. Mm, but if you're really poor and you can't eat and you can't sleep, then you can't get the right mental state, right? Indeed. So you have to change that function. Well, there, there seem to be lingering sociologies of the idea that uh, people are solely responsible for their circumstances. And this is, this is promoted through... Uh, certain ideas, modern ideas, of um, in, in neoliberal yeah. perspectives. Mm. Oh, well, you're poor. Well, uh, you should try harder. You know, you're homeless because, well, you know, there's something not quite right about your character. <laughs> uh, who was that? The, there was the, the, the guy had got to the head of the, the he, he was coach for the England team or something, and he was sacked after this. But he, he had uh, made some statement to the effect where, well, people are disabled because they did something wrong in their last life. Uh, Chinese, traditional Chinese people believe that. Right. So, so you know, <laughs> uh, you know, the, there are various cultural perspectives, you know, in Britain and beyond that rehearse themselves in the way that people then go on and interact with the homeless, or, you know, people who, who do not have a home, for example. Um, and, and those are powerful undertones because for millennia. You've had very powerful arbiters of culture who have stated, well, as an example, God looks after the, his own. And th these are problematic, uh, very problematic. So I think social contagion um, is, is, is a concept we should be aware of 
and thinking and analyzing as, as, as I am doing here, here this evening. So mental illness as a cultural marker of human rights violations, question marks. Now there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of qualification I've got to bring to this. Rightly so. But if we consider that human rights refers not just to legal definitions of what is accorded to individuals in a just society, but also that they correlate with what are necessary provisions for humans as social mammals to be healthy and functional in the society, as a society, a range of questions open up. These questions include scrutinizing the prevalence of support for punitive policies in order to govern society. Um, a really interesting thing happened. Because of a, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really joyful about these chilled out, relaxed, informal spaces uh, to discuss and to share what, what anybody wants to, to share, as long as it's within the human right, you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I remember doing this this event thinking, well, that my, my standpoint is forgiveness is a very important part of being human. And uh, so somebody had approached me and said, I'd, I'd like to do a presentation. I'd, I'd like to talk about prisons because this person had been in prison. And so two people who had been in prison wanted to talk about that. Now, the backlash I found, people were writing to me saying, you should not talk to these people at all. You should not let them publish. You should not talk to them. You should not. And I, I had to say, well, wait a minute. These people have come out of the criminal justice system. I'm not a judge, not a part of making the judge, and I'm not a part of extending their sentence indefinitely. Now, what, what spoke to me was that there are certain people in society who are indefinitely extending people's mistakes, even after, uh, after they, they've served their time as... Uh, so I, I saw this as, as uh, well, it really troubled me. I, I lost sleep and I, I felt extremely anxiety. And the Twitter storm, then, then I was harangued on Twitter. And, and it, anyway, this, this sociological cascade happened. But my major thoughts were with these people. No case of a boy killing his girlfriend in a car crash, and he had to go to prison because he killed her. Not because, well, it was just an accident. It really was an accident. The parents of the girl didn't want to prosecute him because they knew it wasn't. But he, they had to because he killed her, so he ended up in prison. And I mean, I, personally, I think that's wrong as well because if the victims' relatives do not want to prosecute this boy because they knew it was a real accident, a mistake. Why do they have to do it? Because the law says so. It wasn't, you know. Well, Elizabeth Fry is a, a, a figure in prison reform, and for you know, in the nineteenth century, we're saying you cannot just brutalize people. What, what you, we must do is create environments where people can make their rep recompense yeah. if they have wrong. People must find a, a, a you know, there must be a... a, a well, it must be made for people who really have done something stupid, perhaps. And I mean, I've also heard, this was, I was working in a school that was beside a prison. Uh, for young offenders, and there was a 
think she was a referee or something. She went to see these, these prisoners. A lot of them said, oh, and it pays for them as well. She said, well, most of them have caused road accidents and killed somebody. And their life is in tatters. They're absolutely distraught by it. Yet they have to be in prison for five years. And then when they come out, the whole life is lost because they won't find jobs easily. They won't put well, just out of their education because they're usually like eight or something in the there. And so what, what's happening? I mean, I find that so weird that there is a law that tells you you have to be, you've killed someone for five years. Yeah, and it was yes. She said they were they were not even from they were from usually from good families. They were polite. They were never had anything criminal done. They made a mistake and they admitted they were silly or you know driving too fast or whatever it was to get control and that happened. And so she said most of them hung themselves in prison. Yes, there's a. So is that right? Right, was you know amongst those was. There's a very sad epidemic of mental illness that we find in prisons. Yeah. And I remember a very big debate going on about whether prisoners should have access to a television. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, and these, these, again, the social contagion aspect. It, oh, that person's talking to this person. That idea of um, uh, being guilty by association, people will be excluded because they're talking to people they feel do not match their uh, cultural rubric. Yeah, the thing is, with the uh, TVs and prison and such, like, I mean, it used to be the smoking and stuff as well. They allowed them to do it just because it made prisoners easier to control. If they took it away, they'd have more riots and all sorts, you know. But uh, Ray is from a very good uh, discussion group, nearly you know, 10 years ago now. And uh, I remember we did one on, you know, is prison the answer? And I think there might even be a separate one on what is forgiveness. And basically, there were no conclusions reached whatsoever, you know. Very a lot of discussion, no, no uh, actual uh, solutions. It's just making me think of, is it called Hand Razor? Or something? Occam's? Um, hand Occam's maybe? Or Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor. What, don't confuse with malice what can be better explained by stupidity. No, no, well, that sounds like maybe Handlins. Handlins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of stupidity. <laughs> more on my part. Like, yeah, so education would be, make much more sense in most of these cases. And like, most things can be explained by ignorance more than they can by anyone actually going out to harm somebody. Well, Michael Irwin's book, uh, my, my Life Began at 40, he's, you know, he got a 10-year prison sentence, is a great ethnography of the, the living experience inside the penal reform system. And access to education, whilst it's a policy, the practicalities seem to be crippled. Um, so, yeah, I, I you know, th th this is a, a, an area that I, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about human rights in these ways and exploring mental health in respect to this. The culture of the cause of working hypothesis so I was really interested when I discovered uh, Martin Seligman and Stephen Mayer's work, uh, Learn Helplessness. Uh, originally observing how cognitive blunting and affective disorder affected living mammal you know, beings, um, positing that those, you know, living beings <coughs> learn in no, no win situations that they are helpless. Uh, thank you, Ray, for, <laughs> for pointing that the, they return to their research and 
50 years later, learned helplessness at 50. And they realized, oh, well, it's, it's actually, there's a physiological process that comes uh, that, that comes into being through those those circumstances. Um, so, so one one of the experiments they did was they they put a cage with a small barrier, and they put dogs into the cage, and they would electrocute one side, and the dog would jump over, you know, obviously escape. Oh, this is not nice. Where can I find north? Oh, it's, it's fine over here. And then they'd electrocute the other side. And they'd jump back. And back and forth and back and forth. Now, then they thought, well, what happens when you electrocute both sides? And eventually they found they would lie down and just accept the shocks. Their, their surprise was when they opened the, the cage and continued to shock the cage, the dogs would not exit. And they, they went, well, they've learned to, that they're helpless. Um, which brings me into, again, thinking about the, 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 the devastating effects of stress, which involves the release of uh, both the adrenal hormones and opiates. You've heard of beta endorphin. Well, when you measure the, the power of beta endorphins as an opiate, our pituitary gland releases. So um, it, it's gram for gram as strong as apomorphine. So, and it's designed as a, an anesthetic, uh, an inbuilt anesthetic to help us deal with uh, trauma. Um, we're unfortunate enough to maybe be in a car accident and our body goes, oh, terrible things happened. Right. Release this. Put, put, put ourselves into a physiological state of anesthetis. And this affects, uh, you know, mood, cognition, and behavior. Um, and persistent brutalities, they, they can give, result in the same things. Uh, and uh, people can end up in these, uh, I, I'm interested in post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, where people say, have come back from war zones and they're walking around. I, I know somebody who, who was uh, in the military and came back and he heard a car backfire and he just hit the ground and he's hyper vigilant all the time, always thinking and he's it, 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 in a, a, a hyper vigilant state. So these, these things are starting to be discussed more um, and, and understood that you don't, it's not just acute trauma that causes these states, but it's chronic, you know, persistent small amounts of trauma can induce our bodies to be geared in fight or flight mode. Again, school, so in primary seven, uh, we had teacher who suffered from what is called shell shock in these days and uh, there was a side door just next to his classroom and anyone going in there because they knew he had the shell shock thing in the door <laughs> as far as they could and he jumped away he, he, he could be sitting down actually you know yeah. jump up a few inches uh, but uh, because people knew he had it they just kind of slammed the door to him. Yeah. Therapy, well, it's getting, getting your own back to teacher, probably. <laughs> These are probably people who've had them in their earlier years, you know. Yeah. As far as PTSD is, is, and CPTSD, they are apart from other mental health disorders in the DSM-5 because they seem to be the only one that, like, has a culture we 
except have an environmental cause. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I mean, are there, do, you, do you know of, of, sort of other mental health, mental health disorders that might have such obvious external causes? I mean, is that, is that an argument that we're making here? Well, uh, without having, I mean, I, I really struggle to read it cover to cover because my mind goes, oh, more of the same. <laughs> um, uh, is it the ICD-10 has recognized uh, PTSD? It, it, it's an, an, a newer account, like shell shock. Um, people who were in war situations were, before there was an account, they were told, right, you have to climb up this ladder and walk into enemy fire. You're not allowed to run, and that's how war is done. Uh, and uh, Kitchener, if you're interested in a very book, good book on this, um, uh, Alan, it's not Alan, maybe. Alan Clark wrote The Donkeys about the the high command of Britain being um, pretty much malfeasant, you know. But the you know when people were in such a state of trauma, didn't know where they were. People would be wandering around or not be able to respond cogently. Uh, they were by and large treated as deserters or shirking uh, their responsibilities. So in, there were some cases um, uh, in, in the, there was a, a circuit judge who, for the sake of example, where if people hadn't shaved properly, they were held up in charges. Now, uh, Craig, Craig Locker was a place for uh, people to recuperate from these horrors. And they, they wrote, the, they use a lot of writing and creative you know, uh, therapeutic communities to um, help bring people back to a state of well-being. Um, and it's partly through that, that that there was this recognition, oh, well, shell shock's a real thing. These people didn't know where they were. No, but I think the term trauma or trauma or post traumatic could be problematic. I mean, what is a trauma? I mean, a war situation is obviously. But you, you could say that many so called mental people with mental health issues, they might be able to identify the instant or experience in their lives that could be defined as trauma. I mean, like the term PTSD. It's actually used very much now within Hong Kong, the situation of Hong Kong, or the, the, the immigrants from Hong Kong recently, and many of them seem to, to have suffered from PTSD. So, so what is trauma? Gabor Mate says that trauma isn't like an external event, it's how you internalize it, so it's how you react to something. So it could be anything, but it's how you sort of relate to it. It should be some um, I, I think we, we need to, and this is part of mad studies and exploring these subjects, elaborate our understanding of these. Because I think there's administrative trauma. We certainly are seeing secondary trauma, where a situation where, uh, say, say, a support worker as go, going right, okay, I'm here to help you, it, you know, get to a place of minimum <laughs> sufficiency where you've not had a place to sleep. And the tools, the administrative tools they're given are broken. The, there is no way of winning. There's no way of achieving the job remit. You know, doctors are told, oh, well, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening, but the tools I'm given don't, don't work or, or I'm not allowed to use the tools that I think work. 
Now they go away and, and there's an emotional distress because medics, a lot of medics are going, well, I want to help people. So there's a, this idea of secondary trauma and we have to understand more in fine grain the, the, the details of what traumatizes human beings. That it's not just these very visual, very explicit terms, but structural violence can, can result in the release of adrenaline and opiates so that I don't know how to fill out this form. I know I've had this. Like, what does this mean? And the, the person behind the desk goes, I don't know what it means. I just get to, yeah, I'm employed to be here. <laughs> uh, so yes, I, I, I think this is part of, of, of math studies. We, we, we know the picture is not big enough, not detailed enough. So the, the knowledge outside of the medical world, outside of academia, outside of policy, needs the information that, that comes from lived experience. So, I'm going to bring some cultural perspectives in. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Alexander Podromenik wrote this book, uh, Punitive Medicine. He was a psychiatrist uh, in the USSR. He thought that something is problematic, deeply problematic here. And uh, because we're, we're taking political dissidents, any, anybody who's criticizing, clearly they're mad. So we'll put them in a gulag or a mental institution with this label. And people around them will identify them as that. And now that's interesting that there's a correlation with Jeremy Bentham's vision of panopticon, which he wrote not just for a vision of how prisons can uh, be built, but all institutions. And he, he, he talks about creating a, psych, a sociological system where people are pilloried in abstract. Quote. Cool. So... The, the, you know, a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the, the incarceration of free thinking, healthy people in madhouses is spiritual murder. It is a variation of the gas chamber, even more cruel. The torture of the people being killed is more malicious and more prolonged. Like the gas chambers, these crimes will never be forgotten and those involved in them will be condemned for all time during their life and death. So he, he felt strongly how he'd been treated. And as a thinker, he wrote things like the Gulag Archipelago, giving a social document to, to what, was, what was happening. Um, he, here's another book, uh, Jonathan Metzl, uh, The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. Uh, this, this book tells a story of how race gets written into the definition of mental illness. It uncovers the surprising ways anxieties about racial differences shape clinical encounters. The book explores the processes through which American society equates race with insanity. In the, 19, in the 1850s, American psychiatrists believed that American slave, uh, uh, African American slaves who ran away from their white masters did so because of a mental illness called thrapetomania. Medical journals of the era described a condition called dysesthesia ethiopis, a form of madness manifest by rascality and disrespect for the properties, for the master's properties that was believed to be cured by extensive weapon. 
even at the turn of the 20th century, leading academic psychiatrists shamefully claimed that Negroes were, you know, and I use that in quotes, yeah, uh, that word, quote, psychologically unfit for freedom. So that's an, an, another contra- history, history, another sociology we can bring to th- help us think about psychiatry and how it manifests. That was the general kind of attitude. When I was a kid, you tended to look on neo-Negros, as you say, as being kind of inferior in some way or more backward or whatever. And um, it was maybe when they brought that, uh, was that thing about the, uh, about the slaves and stuff? You couldn't have gone to him and put it on. Kind of programs given, well, that kind of uh, gave their side of the story roots. Uh, mm. roots. Um, but I mean, that just seems to be generally accepted. You know, you can tend to look on certain races as kind of inferior, although they'll never be able to do this definitely. And uh, it's taken quite a long time, really, for all these attitudes to change. Well, if we look at the statistics, uh, the, the present day statistics, um, uh, ethnic minorities, and that's another problematic term, black and ethnic minorities is a problematic term, um, are disproportionately affected by psychiatric uh, labels and mental illness. So there, there's some. Th- like, like I'm sort of thinking through, are, are these cultural insignias of human rights violations? Now, if, if to, to make a sort of very uh, clear example, uh, if, if I had gone to Oxford and being white as I am and male as I am, uh, I could maybe walk into an office, and I've, I've, I've met people from Oxford who say, oh, this is totally the case. I could walk into the office and say, oh, well, you went to Oxford, you've got the job, but don't you want to hear what I can do? <laughs> <laughs> now, if I've got a different ethnicity and a, a, a different colour of skin, how... Will, will, will I get an interview? Um, you know, the name that I've got, there, there's cultural connotations in all, uh, there's so much of what, of what we've got. So would it, would it, would it one piss me off? Yes. Would, would my blood pressure go up? Would I walk through the world and feel a deep, a lasting grief. Uh, uh, w- w- would I find myself increasingly in without finance? Statistics, oh yes. So the, these things are, uh, I, I think there's a lot of evidence we, we've got to go through. So, Moving on to the next sort of cultural lens, Jane Robinson has written uh, In the Family Way, Illegitimacy Between the Great War and the Swinging Sixties. In 1913, the Mental Deficiency Act was passed with the euphemistic purpose of furthering and bettering provision for the care of the feeble-minded and other mentally defective prisoners, persons, <laughs> That's Freudian, I think. <laughs> According to the Act, women could be deemed moral imbeciles as well as mental ones and sent to an appropriate institution, a lunatic asylum. Moral imbeciles were defined as persons who from an early age display some permanent mental defect coupled with strong, vicious or criminal propensities. 
This chillingly included unmarried mothers who could not support themselves and were pregnant with their second or later child. Repeat offenders, in other words, whom the workhouses did not want to subsidise, or those families who had had enough of them, uh, under the terms of the Act, all it took for a moral imbecile to be committed was, if she was under 21, was a word from the parent or guardian. I, I remember hearing stories about this, about Craig Lockhart, um, uh, and being, it's, it's an early memory, because it was probably the, the first memory where I went, what's that? And an adult I was with had said, oh, that's the loony bin. I said, well, what's that? Said, well, that's where they send all the crazies. Oh, right. I, I, I couldn't compensate it. It was, it was a mist created in my mind. And then I remember hearing, well, lots of illegitimate children had been housed there and single mothers and un inconvenient family members. You know, it, it, it was, it was it's back to the social contagion. If, if your family member is seen this way, you too may be seen this way. So out of sight, out of other people's minds, It was a very good film, but uh, I think it was based in Northern Ireland, as far as I can remember. And uh, it was a, a home kind of run by nuns, and all the women with the legitimate kids were sent there. But the thing was that if any of them escaped and went home again, the woman's parents would send them straight back to the place. It's such a powerful cultural injunction to be told that a, a, a very statist individual of our community, i.e. doctors in professional, you know, these professional positions, well, you, your, chi your child is this, your, you know, uh, if, if they come to talk to you, disregard what they say. You've got to bring them back to us. And these positions of authority um, shape our, the, the way we behave. I don't know if anybody stood in front of a, a police person and found themselves tensing up, correcting their posture. <laughs> oh, hello? <laughs> you know, uh, another example is, do you ever find that you walk into the libraries and, libraries and become hushed? These, these physical spaces affect us too. Uh, for a long time, I, I felt I didn't belong on academic territory with, without any formal qualifications. <gasps> it was, I was interloping, I was creeping in. Will I get found out? <laughs> <laughs> I used to sit in the back of lecture theatres, <laughs> creeping and uh, steal lectures. Uh, and, and now many... You know, decades on, I, I'm delighted to find so many educators like, oh, well, we love learners. I don't care about your background. If you're, if you're taking things on board and thinking about it, oh, you're, come on in. But not everybody's like that. They're, 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 you know, humanity is a mixed bag. Did you ever get found out? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I ended up telling, that, you know, I know well, I'm, I'm not a part of the university. Um, is it, I, 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 again, I, I then started, to, my practice changed from creeping in to admitting it, to then asking, and then finding out, well, the, I, I think the administrative structures are a lot more impermeable than the individual's working in and under them. Yeah, I don't think that can be the chain, really. I mean, it's just keeping the lights on those kind of people that, that care about it, the admin stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, no, no. It, it, it's it's uh, it's a transformational journey in my life. This is which is why part of reason, you know, why you know, still doing ragged unit. It's like uh, I remember being sort of thinking, well, formal education is going to hate this, uh, and then discovering, no, 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 there's lots of people in formal education. Go, oh, well, I really like this. Could I do a talk? Um, Ray being a, a, a great example here, you know, I, I mean, creating a space where anybody can do a talk. It, it, you just have to love what you're doing, want to, to share, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so overcoming my preconceptions has has been part of my journey. So. Um, so the next lens, cultural lens, comes from Sarah Weiss. Uh, Weiss, um, Inconvenient People, her book, Inconvenient People, Lunacy, Liberi Liberty and the Mad Doctors in Victorian England. <laughs> the following stories have been selected to highlight uh, the, the range of people who had to fight for their liberty against the imputation of insanity. Presented roughly chronologically, the tales reveal various definitions of madness put forward by physicians. What also emerges is a portrait of a bureaucracy, the commissioners in lunacy, that was failing to keep pace with both popular feeling and the views of newspaper opinion mongers. Above all, the lunacy panics of the 19th century highlighted the fear that the English were sleepwalking into allowing medical profession to curb individual freedom by labelling unconventional behaviour, like dancing, <laughs> as a pathological condition in need of cure or containment. So, uh, John Stuart Mill even commented on this. No rank in society is now exempt from the fear of being peculiar. <laughs> the unwillingness to be or to be thought in any respect original. Um, yeah, it, but it's such a powerful concept. I, I, I'm playing with uh, the idea that it's a vacuum concept. And I, what, what, what I'm calling a vacuum concept concept is a co an idea that has no inherent internal logic. Where, where did they come from, these ideas? I mean, because after all, there's a whole kind of institution to say this is not right. Where did they come from? Yeah. The, uh, the, <laughs> I mean... The, I, I think there's a lot. There's a, a very interesting book called Humanness and Dehumanization. There's a collection of writings around dehumanized psychology. How do we see one person as human, i.e. has all the capacities that I do of to think and feel and experience, etc. And what differentiates me from attributing the same thing the another. So in-group, out-group psychology is particularly uh, pertinent to all of this. Um, and from at first dehumanization psychology very much spoke about atrocities. So think about the, the Rwandan massacres. Yeah. Uh, they are not human. We are human. And that, that allows what they call moral disengagement. Well, if they're not, if they don't think and feel like I do, it's fine for me to do these things because they won't feel it. And, and the, the, the collection is really good because it takes us through multiple accounts of this from ethnicity to gender, I get sexuality, and there are particularly, um, I, 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 so the, the, 
moving on from the extreme atrocity, then, then you've got an expansion of the research into the everyday, where, whereby, um, oh, researchers have found that dehumanization goes on as a part of how, how we walk through the world. From the casual indifference, I walk along Princess Street, and if I say, good afternoon, how are you doing? No, 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 no. I'll never get to the other end for my pint. <laughs> um, so uh, at a certain level, we, we have to sort of, particularly in met metropolitan centres, go, okay, I'm not going to acknowledge everybody because it's practical. And, you know, at the other end, you've got these terrible, blatant uh, othering. Th those people aren't human. And in between, you've got things like infrahumanization, which is an interesting phenomenon, which comes of homophily. Uh, birds of a feather flock together. And your group of friends, you see, you experience as more human, because it's immediately evident. In fact, in our own lives, we are most aware of the, the agency we have in the world. We, we feel our own feelings. When we do something, we, we both experience the cause and effect. So, the, uh, you know, I think uh, Anne Cahill's work is really interesting, Overcoming Objectification by Anne Cahill. So she, she, she says objectification as a term takes us so far, but we need new language to understand more of the psychology at play. So we can perceive people as derivative of our wishes. An example is, say I go to the bar downstairs and I go, where's my beer? You are here to serve me beer. Not, not thinking, oh, I kind of like a bit of manners or just, you know, people to be, way, you know, they, they've become a derivative of my intentions. When people acquiesce to my intentions, they're human, but not quite human. They're, 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 they're derivative in my mind. Um, and uh, I like, there, there's a really good commentator and thinker uh, called Alex Haslam, uh, who, who, who again, uh, Thank you, Rick. <laughs> help, help, you know. I think he's got really nuanced understandings to, to unpick the sociologies that are, are at work here. So without being able to fully answer these questions uh, here and now, I think we can understand why these things come into real being in, in social circumstances. Um, so the, the next cultural lens I'm going to be bringing, and the, don't worry, there's going to be a Brexit. <laughs> um, Tommy Dickinson uh, wrote Curing Queers, Mental Nurses, and their patients, 1935 to 1974. Uh, and it, it, it's shocking how recent in our history people's mm -hmm. sexuality was pathologized as a, a, a deviancy, as a mental illness. Um, so on, on, on a winter evening in 1966, Percival Thatcher visited the public toilet here, a young man approached Percival and made a sexual advance towards him. When Percival responded, he was arrested. The man was an undercover police officer. Percival was charged and convicted of importuning and conspiring to incite the police officer to commit unnatural offences. He was given the option of imprisonment or to undergo psychological treatment to, quote, cure his Holt's condition. He chose to receive the treatment. Uh, he was transferred to an NHS psychiatric, psychiatric hospital and was subjected to what he described as a barbaric torture scene 
by the Gestapo in Nazi Germany, trying to extract information from him. And he thought he was going to die. What he had agreed to undergo was aversion therapy in a bid to cure him, him of his homosexuality. Nurses were frequently involved in administering uh, aversion therapies to cure such individuals of what were seen as their sexual deviances. So this was in the 1970s. It's still going on. Well, there are still organisations that claim that you can cure people of you know homosexuality and stuff like that. And as far as the police thing, I mean George Michael got done quite some time in the nineties, was it, or even later? Um, you know, by a policeman, he was hanging around the top, just waiting for someone to to go in. You know, um, there's nothing historical. Well, har harking back to Eirig Scandrick's presentation, so I'm I'm involved in public sociology, and, and it's this this part what, what what we're trying to do, or what I'm trying to do is take the abstract and bring to it the concrete, so we can make comparisons and critiques, and have a dialogue, and like you say things are going on. We're not in the perfect world yet. <laughs> and why are increasing numbers of children, uh, elderly, uh, immigrants, uh, and it goes on, medicated and told there's something biologically wrong with you because you're feeling like this. Um, Yes, we, we've got to look past the, the plainly visible, the explicit, and think about what the invisibility, the, the invisible is. So if somebody can't win, let's think about uh, the, the Windrush generation. Well, we burned all your records, but we just want you to bring your papers. What? What? What the? <laughs> If that's not a double bind created at, you know, in the most powerful bureaucracy, what is? You know, how, how does that affect people's you know, mood, cognition and behaviour? And just going, well, here's very powerful sedation. And don't think, don't, why are you talking about priest brutality again, victim, you know, it, We've got to challenge these cultural narratives with, uh, I, I feel, bringing more and better information in. Um, so, so, some more, a couple of more quotes from uh, Solzhenitsyn, Alexander. Um, the incarceration of free thinking, healthy people in Madness. Have I done that quote before? Yeah. I have. The first one. Please. <laughs> um, this second one I got from the Gulag Archipelago, and I think it, it, it's the, it indicates the power in his prose. If it were all so simple, if only there were evil people where somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the dividing, the, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? So coming to what you said, Mike, uh, about how society had normalized racism. I, I spoke to a, a guy from South Africa about his experiences of the transformation from an apartheid society to one where uh, which is not apartheid or less apartheid um, and it, it, it was really re relaying to me well we were taught as children we, we, we were inculcated we, it was not recognizable 
to the extent that even the dogs were racist. Now, the, the people, uh, the, the, the black people would often do jobs in the, the white neighborhoods. And as they would walk by, the dogs would go, <laughs> you know. And I think it's that, that subtlety we need to look at. So let's think about the media. Well, I know, it's, <laughs> so, is, is, is it a subtlety? Is, it, it, you know, when we read the bloody papers and go, oh, we yeah, have the, the immigrants, this, this, and then we have the next headline saying, we've not got enough jobs because it's sent every, you know, all these people who were working in our support services and NHS and doing, you know, we, I, I look at Westminster and I see the current state of play as gaslighting, as, uh, as creating double binds which creates lots of animosity and I think about Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. So uh, a way to think about morality is, if I do this, I've got to then think, well, if I'm doing this, what if other people did it? Would I be happy? Uh, I, and the categorical imperative is how we scale our awareness up. Right? So I'm, I'm thinking about the categorical demonstrative. The, the, the big figures like, so Boris Johnson, how much of he is he is an exemplar to people to go, it's all right to lie through your teeth. You just go sausages. <laughs> you know? It's okay. I'm not a lovely chappy, but I can see something racist. I can see, you know, something sexist. But, you know, I'm the prime minister. You know, I've got your best intentions in mind. It's, 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 it's a demonstrative figure. And, and when people aren't thinking critically, we, we're in danger of taking on these, these examples of that's fine to do that. And this is where, uh, I guess, a welcome break <laughs> might be well. Uh, so after, let's have a break uh, and uh, regroup in how, how long, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? What, 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 what does everybody fancy? What have you like? <laughs> well, no. 10 minutes. <laughs> and I, I hope to uh, share the story of uh, this, uh, what, 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 by my accounts, my, my reading was a remarkable young woman. Uh, with, you know, amazing talents and trying to illustrate what I'm calling a sociological cascade, which resulted in this atrocity of her being lobotomized at 23. So um, if, if anybody's feeling tender about, the, I, I'm going to try and introduce moments in, in sensitive ways, but please let me be aware, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll raise a hand when, when something is, uh, a bit strong is coming. So, I mentioned uh, Rosemary Kennedy uh, before the break, and I, I spent some time investigating her life, her story, her experience, as best as we can understand. Um, because there's lots of biographies written about the Kennedy family being such a public family. Um, and, and I want to bring this to the front of, of the journey we're going to go through and point out, uh, so Gerald O'Brien is a professor in social work department at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And he said about Rosemary Kennedy, I'm not convinced that she was mentally disabled. Back then, mental retardation was not a clear category. 
and it wasn't gauged in any accurate way. Yes. It wasn't gauged either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I want to also highlight the Professor Susan T. Fisk's work at Princeton University. And she studied levels of dehumanization of, uh, of social groups in general, but also extreme out groups, indicating that people associated with certain societal labels experience dehumanization three orders of magnitude more than other groups. So, such labels include some psychiatric labels, uh, people who have migrated, the diaspora, those without a home, drug users and those who have come out of the penal justice system. And I th what are the orders of magnitude of dehumanization? <laughs> well, she, she mentions this in her presentations online because she's been trying to bring together a fake framework for understanding you know, how much is somebody dehumanized or, or, or otherwise. Uh, and she said, well, we had a real problem with extreme outgroups because they throw all the data because they are so much more uh, or so much less regarded as human beings. Uh, and part of her work has been looking at um, uh, imaging the prefrontal cortex. So when I look at a, a glass, much as I like them, I go, well, this is not sentient. I can't have a conversation with it. If I drop it, <laughs> some might argue, <laughs> If I drop it and it smashes, it's not going to feel. And when I look at all of you, I think, oh well, here are people who are thinking, who are feeling, who have complex internal lives. Um, uh, and I, through this research, I, I, I really liked Luce Iruguay's my pronunciation is terrible, a feminist philosopher, and she talks about if, you, if you're standing in, some, in front of somebody and don't experience a sense of eternal wonder, you, you, you're not seeing a human. So I personally feel that this is a great opportunity because I'm not getting the chance to talk to you through stuff I've been thinking with people who see and think and feel things who can add to my perspective because I don't, I know, I know I've got my opinions, I'm, I'm growing and changing, but there are certain things I don't understand, certain things I don't, uh, haven't grasped. Um, so, I, I would highly recommend you tune into that. Now, she, she was imaging how the prefrontal cortex lights up when we're in front of somebody we regard as human. And, and what was really interesting was that the prefrontal cortex was not lighting up when people were showed stereotypical images of extreme outgroups and part of her work was to ex examine and explore why. Well, I couldn't remember the problem with her was at all. It says here that she experienced seizures and violent mood swings. So that's basically what... Who? Uh, Rosemary Susan Kennedy or Susan T. Fisk? No, Rosemary Kennedy. Right. Yes. Yes, I'm going to be going, going through this. Uh, how do we account for um, understanding a little bit about her experience. Uh, hopefully more than just a little bit. Um, um, yeah, so... And... I'm 
interested in unpicking sociological cascades. Uh, because, because of the rise in the number of people being medicated for mental health diagnoses. Because of the harmful effects of consistently using psychologically altering drugs without addressing sociological circumstances. Addressing the brutalisms, prejudices and inequalities in our society and analysing marginalisation by society and how marginalised groups are disproportionately affected by psychiatric diagnosis and also, I touched on this earlier, the administrative harms, the role of structural violence in producing double binds and learned helplessness. You know, specifically what Seligman and Mayer talk about 50 years later. Now the observations of their original work still stand. The account of those observations has shifted. So I highly recommend looking at their original work and their up-to-date work. Well, for this, I'm going to move us into... This is the full write-up of what I've been walking through today. Um, it's on Ragged University, it's part of the information resources I included in the speaker's information sheet. Uh, it's got all the references that I've used. Because I've often quoted and not gone, ah, this reference and this source, because it, it, it jars the, the, the flow. So I'm going to try and move through and pick out some of the, the things that I think are, are salient moments or, or, or yeah, salient moments of how do we understand of the, the reality where, uh, and apparently, I would argue, uh, a professor of sociology would argue, somebody who's not mentally retarded gets to a situation where, where this irreversible operation designed to impede brain function was, was enacted on it. Now, I argue that when, when we read the biographies detailing what, to, what was known, it was apparent how the educational system, the institution of the family, the medical system, the church, and the government all participated in the effective destruction of this woman's capacity to live an independent life. In short, it is a high-profile human rights travesty. And it started in 1923 when Rosemary was five years old. Uh, she was in the Edward Devotion School of Kindergarten, School Kindergarten in Brooklyn, where her, uh, oh, uh, where her um, teacher had labelled her intellectually disabled and deficient due to her lagging behind her peers in academic standards, which were expected. It can be as simple as that. She's, she's behind the others. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, bottom of the class. The, they're in the last group. They're in the last position. They're the worst at the things we're being asked to be the best at. Um, how this was represented to her parents, she had been stated as a retarded child. 
Rosemary's mother reportedly did not like people who lagged behind or were different. I had high aspirations for her. Now, sociological perspective here, um, it should be borne in mind that, that the eugenics movement was in full swing. Uh, and uh, the Eugenics Record Office was founded by the renowned biologist, eugenicist, and Nazi sympathizer Charles B. Davenport. Uh, and it was one of the leading organizing uh, forces um, in the American eugenics movement. Its activities included collecting large ar archives of family pedigrees sending field workers to analyze individuals at institutions like mental hospitals and orphanages across the US. And these are links that you can click through and get the original records, the historical documents. This was all being bankrolled by American financier and railroad executive E.H. Harmon, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Institution. So these huge forces in cultural production were going, this is how a society should be governed, run, regulated, whatever we want to use as a term. So this is a long case study. Uh, so, I'm, like I say, I'm going to flip through, uh, and whilst I've brought detail to how the eugenics movement was manifested culturally and uh, showing itself in American culture. Can you make the type a bit bigger, control plus, and it'll make it bigger on the screen? I should be able to. Control in the plus key up in the upper right. Oh, oh. oh it's keeping it in the. <laughs> that's better. Oh, I can read that. Stop. Is that better for everyone? Yeah, that's great. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't read the other. Good call. <laughs> um, so, where were we? Oops, we're back at the top. <laughs> Technology. You must have hit another key in between. Uh, we're, we're almost there. Uh, oh yes, I know where we are now. San Francisco. So, um, so, to recap, at five years old, her teacher, her school went, she's behind the rest of the class. She's mentally retarded. In the cultural context of the eugenics movement, talking about defective, functional and defective people. So here's, here's a quote from Larson's Rosemary the Hidden Kennedy daughter. daughter. Uh, Rosemary Kennedy, for not coming up to one metric analysis or another, had been labeled mentally retarded by her teachers at the age of five in a state which had fully adopted eugenic ideologies. Her mother tried various social remedies to improve academic performance of her daughter, stating one child may be smart in studies, one dull, one may be overconfident, confident, one may another shy, and so a different approach must be made. This was to shape the rest of her life, affecting the way in which Rosemary was treated by parents, 
educational system, church and doctors. Now, of course, the Kennedy family was uh, Catholic uh, in their faith system. In uh, uh, a terrain which was uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and the father Joe Senior, who very who had big, great visions for for uh, all of his children, he was being excluded by social clubs, which uh, required certain invitations. So there was very much uh, a cultural alienation uh, that, that you know, this, this has existed in many places, in many times, in many guises, but uh, people who are familiar with uh, Edinburgh and Scottish history will be familiar with the prejudices which surround uh, uh, sectarian divides. Now, this child started to be passed to anybody who could fix her. Can you fix my daughter's performance? Who's got the solution? And uh, Rose's consultations, Rose, Rose was the mother and Joe was the father. Rose's consultations with a variety of doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, academic specialists, and religious leaders took on new urgency. None offered Rose what she thought was best for Mary, making her terribly frustrated and heartbroken. Rose was accustomed to controlling her children's social and intellectual lives, and she was determined that Rosemary would not be separated from the family. Joe Senior, too, believed that Rose, that Rosemary, keeping Rosemary at home and enrolled in nearby private schools provided with more benefits than an institution for the mentally disabled world would. So the, she's obviously from a greatly privileged background. There was money, there was resources, uh, and uh, again, I'll try and stick to the, the, the story as I gleaned it. So you can imagine the, uh, the concern that, that uh, you've got a mentally defective daughter and, and how the eugenics movement and the prejudice in society saw this as social contagion. Well, if your daughter is like this, how does this reflect on you? Uh, so the eugenic, eugenics was fueled by pseudoscientific claims that the human races, race consisted of two classes, the eugenic and cacogenic, or poorly born. The cacogenic eugenicists claimed inherited bad germplasm and thus as a group at the very least, should not breed. African Americans, immigrants, the poor criminals were often deemed cacogenics. Fears of the immigrant horde streaming into American cities and migration of African Americans out of the deep, deep south into northern and western cities led some native born white Americans to embrace these beliefs. So this is resonant with with stories uh, with uh, with uh, shouts we hear with lots of diaspora. They're coming for our jobs, and we we hear the media now fueling these kind of rhetorics. Just uh, just to add, "cacos" is root the root Latin word for it means shit. Yeah. It literally means the word shit. Let me look at that right here. Yeah. All right. It's a horrible term. Ah, yes. Thank you, thank you. I didn't realize the, the, the etymology there. So yes, good people, shit people. Pretty, yeah. pretty blatant there. So 
we, we so what does eugenic mean? You, you means goodness. It means goodness and balance. Like eudaimonia is like a, a, a happy state we should all strive for. Right. Because I know how the word's been used about that separation, but I never knew that the eugenic class was the good class. Yeah. Euphoria, the good. Yes, euphoria, good euphoria, cacophoria. <laughs> I'm feeling like shit, mate. Yeah. That's good I mean, shit. There's a root Dutch word for shit, which is cuck. And so I cuck, thought yeah. that it's, it reminds me of that, so you looked it up. Yeah, I, I yeah. heard it from the Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, caca. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 same. So, you've got this medicalization of how how you're going to, uh, you know, society is going to ensure the best people uh, get the opportunities that, uh, that things that happen in the world around are done by people of upstanding character, etc. These easy to trip off the tongue of it. I often think about this uh, nonsense we hear about um, criminal justice, the, the idea that if you put everybody in prison who has committed a crime, well, there will be no more crime. It, it seems to be a, a, a policy for spiraling downwards. And there's, uh, on the Ragged University site, there's actually a, 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 a recording and transcript I made of people who were in senior positions, uh, one, Herman, uh, one inspector of prisons, who, and they were asking, are our prisons fit for purpose? So very, very good uh, analysis going on. Professor Leslie McCara points out that the police are curating their client group and it's uh, you know she's followed policy over several decades four decades i think and pointed out that uh well we can we people are producing another policy paper but it doesn't seem to change the culture so scotland's one of the, the a place where it somebody can become criminalized at one of the youngest ages in the world, she points out. And originally in Britain, when you were put in prison, you had to pay your jailers. And a lot of people couldn't get out of prison because they didn't have the money to pay the jailers. And in order to be released, you or friends of yours had to raise the money to pay the jailers because you paid like your rent and keep. I wonder if G, G4S might like that policy. <laughs> <laughs> no, because they often wouldn't get paid. But, yeah. It's still older in Scotland as well than in England. It's still what? From the lowest age that so you can be criminalised. And, and also... Uh, you can be criminalised from 10 years old in England. It's 8 years old here. Is it? I thought it was 12, isn't it? Uh, they it were may, talking it, of raising it. It may have changed since... She spoke then yeah. and now, but that's one of her her policy points that she'd been working on, bringing evidence and going, we, we, we've got to address this, because the children panels are not innocuous. They can remain as a record until the age of 40. So, And then we have a wonderful thing that um, in Scotland, I don't know if in the UK, uh, you don't, you don't get a fixed sentence because if they deem that you're not uh, reformed, you don't get out at the end of your, sir, your your sentence. Whereas in other countries in the world, you get out at your sentence unless you do something <coughs> terrible. But it, terrible doesn't mean that you're not reformed. It means you've done some horrible act. And if you were good, you get out earlier. But in Scotland, if they can deem that you should be kept longer. How are you supposed to be reformed if you're literally being sent to like university for criminals? You're surrounded by this. You're supposed to rise above it. Yes, you're right. And also, the other thing we have is uh, 
you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, but a tremendous amount of the people in jail in Scotland are on remand. Because you're maybe innocent, but we don't trust you, so we'll treat you as though you were guilty. And that can go on over a year, years, because they don't have everything ready to try you. Yep. yep. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, you know what? Uh, all the more is need reason for a thinking, a critically thinking population. Who guards the guards? We do. We go, you're not, that's not right. We need to change this. Must come from the population being uh, crit critically thinking and sentient and, you know. But so, there's a Howard League in Scotland. Howard and, League. And Howard League comes from John Howard, who was the sheriff who did a lot of these studies and said, wow, this is going on. He, he visited all the prison systems in the UK uh, more than once and looked at these systems like you have to pay to get out uh, and things like that. And, uh, and, and the thing is, nowadays the Howard League, you go to the meetings of it and you have judges and you have police and you have social workers and almost all of them think it's wrong, but it's the populace that's saying those people did the crime, they should do the time. The Howard, Howard League for Penal Reform have long campaign for, for like, uh, you know, I mentioned Elizabeth Fry earlier. She was an early campaigner to, who went in, looked at the conditions and said, this is just not morally right, it doesn't make sense. So, yes, institutional reform. I, I think we're, we're in a position where we need administrative and institutional reform. Well, society needs to perpetually be evolving, I, I feel. But we have that, but you said we need to change the system, but it, it's the kind of we that elects uh, the conservative government, that uh, the we is. Well, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but, well, yeah. okay, but when you say we, it's not just people that agree with, might agree with us. I don't know what we all think about what's the right thing to do. No, it's I, everybody. I, I'm not suggesting that the, uh, the political system is functional. But certainly when I, I come into contact with somebody, I feel my responsibility is to extend all, all the considerations that I want considered for me, to them, and otherwise. And you're receptive to theirs. <laughs> well, hence, hence being here tonight, it's not about me delivering information, but getting reflections and trying to learn for, through dialogue. You know, it's part of uh, trying to take the abstract and bring the concrete to it and think through, hmm, is this matching up? You know, there's lots of policy documents that that read very well, but when we look at the cultures that are enacted, they they're they're not maybe living up to their job remit. So, um, the, the the next sort of institutional lens thinking about it is indeed the 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 Catholic Church of which the, the Kennedy family were a part. Now, um, the, the church at the time did not recognize uh, mental, physical, mental, and uh, mentally um, disabled people as being a part of their flock of their considerations. Physically too. Yes. Uh, it, it, the, uh, there was a reformer that uh, took this on and um, but I, I, and I will come to this but I, w I do want to tune into this th this piece of uh, biography so, um, specialists 
holds uh, Rose, the mother, took Rosemary to experts in mental deficiency, but there are assessments and recommendations left Rose discouraged. The specialist told her that Rosemary had suffered from an unspecified genetic accident, a uterine exact accident, a birth accident, and so forth. Um, some of Rosemary's siblings believed that she also suffered from intermittent epileptic seizures. Eunice, her sister, remembered sudden and hurried calls to the doctor who would rush to the house and administer injections and medications to Rosemary. I can remember at the Cape, she says, the doctors coming in and giving her shots and then disappearing. Whenever one of these episodes occurred, the children were whisked away to another room or sent outside to wait until doctor, the doctor left. And only then were allowed to resume their activities. None of them dared ask what was wrong with Rosemary. So, so these labels, these medical interventions have a hush, a silence drawn around them. Uh, and I, I remember the, 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 the force of anger I got when I spoke to a doctor about uh, an elderly friend asking, should they really be, in, be prescribing temazepam constantly for 10 years without reviewing this and I was told on no uncertain terms that I didn't know what I was talking about. They were the medic. I didn't have knowledge. But I had read the British National Formulary and understood no there needs to be reviews of the medication. That's really not standard practice. That's it's not recommended practice. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm sorry. It depends on what time school you're looking at. If you're looking at 1950s, for example, the prescription of benzodiazepines was extremely common, and people were on them for a very long time. Valium, Ativan, these kind of uh, drugs were being prescribed like sweetens, and people were encouraged to take for a long time. And then, of course, you discovered that people were actually getting addicted to them, and that was then a big problem. And we started to reduce the prescription of antidepressants, and they've largely disappeared now in many respects. Oddly enough, they've been replaced by antidepressants. The opioids. Yeah, well, opioids, yeah, I think it's some of the opioids as well, which would be a big problem in America. But uh, the, the, the prescription of benzodiazepines, what we like to classify, was extremely common and became a major issue. There were television programs <coughs> about it, all kinds of stuff in that time. There's still a high rate of addiction in at least Europe in Scotland, though, I remember that. Well, one of, the, yeah, one of the interesting things was that one of the reasons they started to cut back on prescribing benzodiazepines was that, that uh, Valium uh, became a uh, street drug. Uh, and it was being used as an addictive drug, and they were saying, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Is it the drug. same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Valium is Pentadan. Yeah. Well, Pentadan's are different drugs. Uh, Valium is one. Well. Uh, Valium is diazepam. Valium is diazepam. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> These being aware of these, uh, um, the, the right way to use pharmacy is, I think, uh, indeed uh, an important part of the general citizen too. So you can access the British National Formulary online. I was asked to do a report on methylphenidate, Ritalin, uh, and it's the joke is a joke prescription. Indeed, I, I, I pointed out a number of things that uh, to try and leverage new conversation. And one thing, I, I, point one was uh, it may be a problematic medication because as a side effect, if you're medicating for hyperactivity, it also has a side effect of hyperactivity. Um, it has uh, 
associated with a uh, sudden death disorder. Uh, it was it, it was problematic in a small amount of cases. So it's, it's a powerful medication. It's, and the manufacturer's guidelines said that if it's going to be prescribed, it must be uh, for, I think it was six years or over. I mean, I'm going back a couple, few decades now. Ah, oh, I'm old. <laughs> but um, Six years or over. Six Eight. years or older. Now, one, I was doing this report for a, a charity of where parents were bringing their children, going, I don't want to use this stimulant medication. I don't want to use amphetamines. Uh, what alternatives are there? And I was a sort of library gopher. I would go off and find out about this. So I went to the British National Formula. I went, here you go. Let's try and avoid you know, to uh, unreviewed or un uh, contended perspectives. Uh, and so I went to BNF and the manufacturer's guidelines and said, well, if you're going to prescribe this, you need to do bloods every six months. And that makes it an expensive medication to administer. Yeah, and you have to review it every so many months. We heard of a Harley Street doctor prescribing over the phone to a two year old. Oh, yeah, it used to be over six. Or Absolutely. Six. This doctor yeah, was eventually sure. brought to account. But that was. That was. Doctors. In the run up to 2000. Doctors take those things as recommendations, and, and then they. Uh, yeah, they are also incentivized to prescribe these things. I have some lived, lived experience with methylphenidate, so I, I was um, diagnosed with ADHD in, in, when I was twenty, so about so eight years ago now, and uh, I think a large part of my diagnosis, me seeking the diagnosis, was motivated by wanting methylphenidate. I tried it in a recreational context, and very quickly I became. Very addicted to it. I, I worked out you could crush up the pills and sniff them, and I'd get through a whole prescription within the space of a week. And then I quite quickly worked my way up to the highest prescribable dose, which is 120 milligrams a day, and would get through that in the space of two weeks. And for, to my first psychiatrist who had diagnosed me, I said, I'm ruining, I'm at university, this is fucking my life up, I, I can't have this anymore. You need to put a mark on my record that says I can't be allowed prescription uh, prescription stimulants. And they said, yeah, fine, and discontinued treatment, no other support or anything. And I went away thinking, maybe I should go and question this ADHD thing. Two years later, I went and got re-diagnosed, put back on Ritalin. Within two months, I was abusing it just as much as before, and it happened again. This happened three times with three separate psychiatrists. I, I'm not absolutely fine now, but I've been producing, <laughs> like, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy as now that I've been, I've been off it for four years, it's, it's absolutely fine now, though. but there's, there's individuals out there that aren't as lucky as I am. I don't with, get with it, that, because you know? at the school where I work, there were kids from Ritalin, it's high school, yeah. but it doesn't, it stops working by the time they, they reach a kind of level of 14, well, 15 years old. They can't use it anymore. They need well, that's the idea. I mean, they, they, they think of ADHD as a, as a developmental disorder, and the idea is that, like, the Ritalin is supposed to help you catch up in those deficits that you have by the time you're 14, 15, 16. Yeah. But if you're an adult, you're expected to be kept on it for a much longer period of time. I didn't even know they prescribed it to adults. I thought they mm -hmm. might get something different, but on your own, you're it's, off it. It's Ritalin is fascinating because alongside SSRI antidepressants, it's a drug that's shown the greatest growth in prescription over the last 30 years or so. If you go back to if you go back, if you go back to around 1995, Brooklyn was hardly heard of, ADHD was hardly heard of, hardly diagnosed. And when it was diagnosed, it was only diagnosed in children. The diagnosis of ADHD in adults is a relatively recent thing. But, uh, and the, there are major questions about whether ADHD actually exists at all. 
or whether you're actually looking at a range of other problems that are simply lumped together because the pharmaceutical companies are very keen to sell you little bit. We were just discussing this in the corner, so I mean, I, 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 I think the, the way we've zeroed out is to stimulate medication as, as, a, as an appropriate treatment for ADHD or attention based disorders. It's just it's, it's fundamentally thought, I and mean, you, you measure the efficacy of these things based on, on questionnaires that you give people while they're high on the drug. And the effects of being high on speed look a lot like the effects of like not having ADHD, I suppose. And the drugs wear off, and your symptoms come back, but the fact that you're just not high anymore. It's supposed to be a crutch in medication yeah. while you get a load of therapy mm-hmm. and sort of given strategies to help you manage yeah. so that you can come off. Yeah, but wasn't it used no, without therapy? Yeah, 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 there's no therapy yeah, for ADHD. Yeah, like, yeah, a lot of the time. It's very interesting the ideal, program on the Which is why ADHD is a general yeah, set of explained yeah, 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 thing to teach the program for. And it's quite vague, but. Sorry, you were just sharing that there's a very interesting. There is an interesting course on future learning on ADHD. I think it's done by uh, UCLA. I forget, forget which university it is, but it's a very long study and it talks about people who are adults and who didn't, who couldn't focus, because basically it's a lack of focus. And they then have children diagnosed with ADHD and they go to the doctors and they get diagnosed, but there are is brain imaging and kind of things going on and it is really hard to diagnose because it affects different parts of the brain and different people. So there is no one and all cure. Well, there's no one and all biomarker. The, no, brain, there is no, no. So you, you can have it and it can be for mostly a ghost. You grow out of it, but there are people that have it their life long. And yeah. it's not that they're hyperactive, but they have no focus, no long term focus. And you learn to live with it, and I think the basis is to learn to overcome it um, by changing your lifestyle. And the education is purely there for short term. Changing your lifestyle, how? Well, that's up to bringing more focus into it, building strategies, building strategies, getting help when you need it. The most therapeutic thing I did for myself was stop believing in the diagnosis. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, you can. I don't know, but I mean. I would say have a look at it because it's an interesting study, um, and they're still studying it. I mean, there's no, there's no solution. Well, to, see, but it's to bring in sort of. Uh, so I'm interested. I, I mentioned this earlier. Stress biology causes a release of adrenaline in all the adrenal hormones, both mean adrenaline, noradrenaline, and then you've got a response to that which is the release of endorphins. And endorphins actually then cause a, a release of dopamine. Now, if you look at the metabolism of the, what, are, what are called the catecholamines, dopamine then gets metabolized to adrenaline and noradrenaline. And I presented a paper at uh, the... National Society for the Study of Addiction, suggesting that this is a positive feedback loop in our biology. Now, you mentioned earlier, Robin, how we can get addicted to stressful situations, you know, addicted to stress hormones, and that that account of uh, uh, the adrenal opiate. But entirely, I mean, just to contextualize what opiates are, they're very simple proteins. They're found throughout nature. They're involved a lot of the time when, um, in circadian rhythms, in rhythmic responses. So uh, part of, I, I go running, I don't. <laughs> but if I did, if I did exercise, um, or when I eat, there's a certain response of satiation. And these very small amounts of these signals go, this has happened sufficiently for you to stop feeling this desire. Um, 
And, of course, the British Empire discovered, oh, opium from a poppy and refinements of that. Herring, apomorphine, morphine, etc. Well, this is, this is very useful as an anaesthetic. And it's also very addictive. And they did things like funneling, growing opium in India after the Raj had kiboshed the, the culture. And then they funneled opium into Chinese communities. And the opium wars. So that was East India Company. So it's a very problematic history. But this is mirroring, this is tuning into a biological response of how we deal with stress. Why, I, I, if, if enemies, say, really clobbered their leg and, but not felt pain, I, I, I've had a few injuries and I've been fascinated. I'm like walking around going, ah, it's okay. And they're like, friends are going, no, 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 you're not. We'll get, go to the hospital. I'm fine. No, no, no. But I couldn't feel any pain. And I was disoriented. And that is all endogenous production. Endogenous, the body produces from internal. Exogenous, taken in from the outside. Um, so, yeah, the, the, these, these biochemistries have not been problema problematized. And indeed, I've heard from... What do you mean have not been pro problematized? Um, thought through. Right? So, the, the classical textbook is uh, the Rang and Nail. Pharmacists go, right, okay, we're going to talk you through. Why, why would you give aspirin in this circumstance? Now, how does aspirin work? Well, it inhibits an enzyme called <laughs> cyclooxygenase 2, and so on. So the biochemistry, what's, what's the, the mechanism of action? I've heard from studying medics that more and more biochemistry has been cut from the curriculum. So people are being introduced more and more to a rubric well, you give this under this circumstance. And there's a lot to the medical art and science. I don't diminish it. But I guess the, the increased pressure on the educational systems, the shortening of courses, the greater intensity of uh, study that people are being driven to, to get through, the greater number of pharmaceuticals available may all contribute to these system, system effects of how medicine is uh, practiced. And, and that's, that's indeed what, what I'm trying to bring in here with Rosemary Kennedy. So she was medicated at the age of five. And, and uh, the, the term for harms caused by the medic is iatrid and it harms. Um, and of course, certain medicines give rise to certain side effects. And as mentioned with hyperactivity and methylphenidate, when can you distinguish, when you cannot distinguish the side effect of the medicine from the, the purported condition, there's a logic issue here. Um, which has to be uh, engaged with. Um, so this this young girl had been, you know, they, they were injecting her with uh, pharmaceuticals and giving pills, and she wasn't functioning well in school, and the society was going well. A shit person. You've got a, a bad seed in your family. And the church was going, oh, well, we'll give you communion, but not her. So don't, br don't bring her to church. You know, these, these build up. They're, they're, there's back to Fitchoff Capra and uh, uh, systems thinkers like uh, Gregory Bateson. 
And, and I can only imagine what this kid's doing, like going, I'm really trying. If I do this, will you treat me like you do my sisters or my brothers? Uh, well, we're, we're and, you know, they're constantly reinforced. Well, well, we'll talk about this later, Rosemary. So I, I want to get more into the, 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 the role that pharmacy was playing in her life. Uh, and uh, the etiology, the account of why these things were happening. She was having seizures, and she was getting accumulating these. You know, so, so she's a, you know, ment- your daughter is mentally retarded and an epileptic. Um, so. I started looking into the history of anti-epileptic drugs and phenobarbital, you know, barbiturates, which have uh, significantly been reduced, like Ray pointed out about benzodiazepines. There, there are certain medications that get wheeled out very quickly and go, oh, this is a miracle thing, and then all of these problems crop up and then uh, the they go, oh, well, we better stop, or we've got to reduce giving this out because of all the problems. Uh, and I, I thought, oh, well, okay, I, I don't know for certain which prescription she was given. We know that in 1912, uh, this heavy sedative was used, they invented, but also. Uh, we've got ethox, ethosuximide, carbamazepine, valproate, and several bands of azepines. And we've got, this is the, the source on this. So then I went to the Rangendale and the British National Formulary. The Rangendale is a, a beautiful textbook. I think it's really, really brilliantly honed as a text. Uh, it's great educational experience. Um, and updated frequently? Updated frequently. It's still used uh, as, as a canonical text. You know, for both of these. It, there's not, I don't think there is a British general practitioner or doctor who won't have used these things. So there's, there's also, you know, things like the Martindale, the ABPI data compendium sheets. So th- th- there are... St- systems that have been introduced over time when medics go, I'm seeing a problem, I've got to write about this problem and send it back. Because a lot of things are done with you know, good intentions but have bad outcomes. Um, and I started to look at the side effects associated with the, the, the medications and we've got Drowsiness, sedation, dizziness, lethargy, suicidal thoughts and behaviour, etc. Um, and I, I've got everything in a, a grey box in this article is a verbatim extract from the text that I've cited. Um, and this, this idea of iatrogenic uh, positive feedback loop. So here's a kid being... Imagine being given a sedative medication and then being told to perform academically. Um, you know, the teachers go, oh, well, she's been staring into space again. You know, obviously this is the diagnosis and not the medicine. These kind of issues can arise. Um, That is with epilepsy, the big balance for a lot of people is do uh, you want to gain more of your lucidity but still suffer from more attacks? And uh, it's not an easy balance to achieve. So I, I'll, I'll let you sort of go. This this is all from the Rang and Dale. Uh, and uh, this is from the British National Formula. So, 
uh, just to pick through stories, you've got um, abnormal behavior, cognitive impairment, confusion, depression, drowsiness, memory loss, suicidal behaviors, anxiety, hallucination. But this isn't broken down, you know, when you get that slip of paper that comes with your drugs, it'll say, well, okay, one in 10 have this, one in 100 have this, one in 1,000 have this. But when you just list it like that, uh, I don't know if it has as much meaning. It, uh, it, it is listed like that, but these, these, this is essential information for medics. But it doesn't say the frequency. No, it's not something like anything. I mean, any thoughts you get, I'm going to put up. It's very it relevant to know. Tell you what's common and what isn't. You, maybe you okay, so you, very rarely let, let's go through things. just one of these entries, right? And you've got it broken down into common or very common, uncommon, rare or very rare. That's right, it gets more meaningful, but it's still not saying what the criteria is. I know, it's so rare and very rare and referring back to, I referred to a book called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, where Duradini and McHenry have gone through court records where uh, multinational drug uh, pharmacy companies have been taken to court, and the court has forced them to reveal precisely the, the detailed information how, how, how have you come to produce this uh, for this condition? We sure, would... they're just looking at the cover themselves. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Know, they may say in very rare cases, or one in a thousand, or one in ten thousand, or whatever, you know, such and such thing might happen. Surely they're just doing that to cover themselves for the extremely rare reaction that someone might have to take in a drug. Well, you, we'll have to, like uh, Giardini and McHenry are doing, analyze this. And, uh, for example, aspirin, a tremendously useful thing, but occasionally people have life-threatening interactions. And people who are going, okay, uh, this child or this person has a, a, a fever, it, it brings the fever down. Is there something else? Do I? I need to ask in this situation: Is this child hypersensitive to anything? I need these indicators. Is this an appropriate therapeutic response, or is it inappropriate? And that's why medicine is considered both an art and a science. Yeah, but what we're basically getting at, I think we're agreeing on this. If they didn't say there was a tiny chance that such and such a thing might happen, and then it did, the drug company could be in trouble because they didn't warn people about it. That's reasonable. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about in court, um, the thing is that in court so much depends on the presence of the witness, the personality, and the way they present things. So uh, people that have a very convincing personality can get great fees for presenting evidence in court because they just sound so authoritative that people don't drill them to find more information. Well, I was once given a, a medication which I felt uh, absolutely, it, it impeded my capacity to function in the world. I had a, a very long, hard fight to go to not take that medication. And uh, I found it had been withdrawn several years later because people were keeling over with heart attacks. And, and so, yeah, it, it, this is problematic. It's especially problematic without transparency of private interests. But we, we're always weighing this off against uh, the, the moments when we turn to people with medical expertise and say, could you help me? But they also date all that information. You always find the date on it. So if someone does have some reaction, then it gets reported, it goes back to the manufacturer and they'll add it to their list. So these lists can be updated every, I mean, it might be every 
like 10, 20 years. I mean, you know, so, but, uh, there's always a date that tells you yeah. this is the latest information as a so, so I would There's say, a question about how how well that procedure of uh, starting a ticket on a medication, how frequently, when people have the problem, hmm. do they actually report it? Does it go through? Because well, it seems like a lot of times it doesn't. Report it, yeah. Yes, well, if they don't, you know, you know. well, I was interested in the book you were referring to about <clears throat> whether well, medical diagnosis is actually something that's very evidence based in the first place. It's interesting, I'm particularly I'm talking about uh, mental health issues and mental health medication, but when DSM-5 came out, know, which I think was in 2015, DSM is. there was a major row about that because they were pointing out that many of the things that were being diagnosed, there was no evidence that it was actually a medical cause. And yet they were defining them as medical problems and prescribing things for them. And what people have been saying is that the medication is not tackling a problem because there's no defined problem there to tackle. What it's doing at best is suppressing the symptoms. And if you're doing that, the danger is you're suppressing lots of other things too. And then you get lots of negative effects out of that as well. And there was a major row about whether DSM-5 should actually be produced at all. Because people were saying, where is the evidence in any of that that you've actually identified a medical problem that requires medical treatment? What is DSM-5? That roused me in there since the beginning with the DSM, the DSM one. So the, that's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. That's how all mental health disorders are like technically defined. Okay. And so the, the the history of it is really interesting. The motivating factor for putting it together in the first place was one doctor that did a study where he had his students go. He, he gave them a set of symptoms that they were going to go and present to a bunch of different psychiatrists, and they came and reported back which diagnoses they got from all of these separate psychiatrists. And it was that he published the findings and found that there was no inter-rater reliability for a given set of symptoms across any supposed disorder whatsoever. So this is a huge embarrassment for the psychiat psychiatric industry, I suppose, in like the 70s, which precipitated needing uh, the DSM. But the, the whole point of the DSM isn't to actually like define well, it's ideology simple. based. You're, well, you're kind of. I mean, it's all about trying to maximise inter-rater reliability, mm -hmm. rather than actually trying to be like, here's a here's a disorder with an etiology. And the original volume was 135 pages long, if I remember correctly, and the current version is 900 and something pages long, well, because they keep inventing added bits, and the added bits don't make a lot of sense. I mean, one of my favourite ones is oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> which I refute that. <laughs> Then you can diagnose them with oppositional defiance. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, that's 99% of all the kids I have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to worry about it. You, you were going to say something. I was going to add it, right? Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, I was going to add to your point that that like, culture is so embedded in the whole mental health system. Like, I went to an interview for a mental health social worker and dared to sort of say that maybe the drugs aren't actually tapping the root causes and it's just sort of creating more problems and maybe not talking to the root of these problems. And I was told I would never get a job in social work or mental health with that attitude ever. <laughs> well, the slightly more encouraging thing is that some of the official organisations are now beginning to say that too. That there was a report last year from the National Institute of Clinical Health and Excellence, which was talking particularly about depression, and it was saying, Maybe we should stop thinking of these as medical problems and start worrying more about what actually causes them. Yeah. Uh, and there was a review also last year of the Scottish government's mental health policy. And I was involved in some of the discussion around that. And they were saying something very similar. They were saying maybe we should get away from seeing this as purely a medical issue and start to think about what are the other things that might be going on here that cause these kinds of difficulties. With all these disorders, okay. there's, there's this, uh, another review that came out just last week in Nature showing how many of the symptoms of each disorder in the DSM are comorbid with other disorders, and it's, it's all of them. There are some, like 12 <laughs> symptoms out of 20,000 that are unique to a single disorder. There's, there's nothing else, but the fact is, like, every disorder is comorbid with poverty. 
<laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, deprivation was certainly one of the things that the Scottish policy identified as being a major association with mental health problems. It was also the cause of most ACEs. Yeah. I, <laughs> Without I, poverty, there wouldn't be that many. I, I know you've done a, a lot of work and been involved in some of that. Would, uh, would you consider maybe doing a, a, a presentation at some point? <laughs> I'll put my foot in that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Well, I'm always happy to talk to people if people are addressing this. That would be lovely. And, and likewise to, to the whole room, it, it gets really interesting and valuable when everybody, uh, you know, starts sharing. And, you know, I would argue that the it's the gestalt space that's been the greatest attribute of human beings. The, this, the gestalt is the, the, it's greater than the sum of its parts. Together, we can achieve something that's greater than the sum of our individuality. So, yeah, just so I, 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 I'll twist your arm on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I, I realise I, I, we're, we're over time now, but then, so I think, don't, don't feel you have to stay. Uh, there's, there's a little bit more that I can take you through. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to point out was that um, heroin-based preparations were being marketed for treating children's uh, basic ailments. Um, and the, the picture hasn't loaded here, but this is a picture of a beer heroin bottle and, and the marketing is, is spectacular. Oh, here, this one's loaded. Ah, beer, aspirin and heroin. So the, the descendant. <laughs> there, do you feel better? I, every kid gets sniffles. And often gives the parents sniffles. Yeah. <laughs> but can you, it's not unimaginable that at five, right, you've had a, a stinking cold. Beer says, oh, you know, I went to the pharmacy and the pharmacist said, take some of this. This brings down your fever, you know, sedates you. Here you go. Now off to school you go. This, this, <laughs> Cold turkey and five year old wanders in and goes like, "What am I meant to do here? Oh, just do this. Oh well, why am I the last in my class? Why have I got this headache? Ah, you know, why am I breaking out in cold sweats? You know, and, and oh, she's just been ill. So, uh, and then you know, it, it leads to, well." Coming off of these things causes convulsions, causes seizures, and the doctor goes, oh, well, I've got something for that too. Oh, barbiturates. And we'll just, we'll, we'll, don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll keep you right. And then gets this uh, diagnosis of epilepsy. And I was just shocked at the medical etiology of, you know, the, why does epilepsy happen? And um, it's, it was dominantly formed by this Samuel August Tiso uh, in the last third of the 19th century, a reputed Calvinist Protestant neurologist, physician, professor, and Vatican advisor. He had published a long Nazism. Or dissertation uh, physique sur la maladie produit pour la masturbation, uh, attributing seizures to masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see this 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 positive feedback loop is starting to reinforce itself, and you know, oh, you know, they then go to their 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 cleric and go, father. We're worried our daughter, we think our daughter's been masturbating. <gasps> Mental defective too. You know, and, and you know, there's, there are these uh, academics who have 
documented this this medical history and society at large, you know, um, it is sex averse, sexual ex expression averse, especially in women. You know, she's living in a highly patriarchal society. Um, and so, so it, it, her, her journey continues and you know, there's a whole section on this from multiple authors I've tried to draw on because I thought, surely not, surely this is absurd even hundreds of years you know, ago, somebody should have said, but no, the normalization of authoritative perspective. Um, so, well, her parents were very concerned and um, wanted to find more and more ways of trying to fix what was wrong. And so they started packing her off to different private institutions and boarding schools. And there's a, a particular uh, woman where, so here, here's something interesting. So she wrote journals. She regularly wrote letters back to her parents. Um, and she, one of her schooling tasks was to, to translate French books into English. Now my partner, she speaks French, and I said, what do you think about this as an intellectual task? And she's like, oh, that's, that's, that's serious brain power going on there. Uh, it's not easy to translate, you know. So, um, and her, her brother, Teddy, remem remembers her as the person he could go to, the together one. You know, uh, ah, uh, and so they decided at a certain point uh, to um, send her off to a, a, a holiday camp, and they had told her, "Well, you're going to be teaching children, not you are. You know, they are the ward of you." And they went, they said, right, we, we, we need this guardian to accompany her all, every moment of the day. Now, can you imagine somebody following you around all the time? That privacy. One of the things that keeps on coming up about evidence for her diagnosis was her propensity to go out for walks at night. Yeah, because I'm being followed. You know, just give me some space. Is I, I you know, I, my my instinctual reaction. Um, and of course, she was very she was very attractive. So boys would sidle up. You know, all through for the last seven years, going, what the, the, the natural human thing? I'm attracted to you, and the more that boys were attracted the more, oh no, but uh, you know, what about and all of these other tensions going on in parents' minds? Well, we've got to protect her from herself and from boys. Um, so at, at a certain point, you know, in, in this holiday camp, she, she realized that, uh, oh no, 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 she was not doing the teaching. She had been basically placed there to be out of sight, out of mind. Um, and what struck me was, um, what, at a certain point, the, 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 the two women in charge of the holiday camp noticed that she was in extreme pain walking and realized that her shoes were too tight and they were, her feet were bleeding. 
So they took her to a, a podiatrist to get her proper shoes. Now, I know uh, a girlfriend I had many years ago. I remember seeing that. And, and my girlfriend said, I said, isn't that really painful? She said, I don't want big feet. It was a, a, not the aesthetic norm. So that was in, what, 1990. I said, you've got to get better shoes. It, it, it was a societal aesthetic pressure. Um, but there are written instructions that, that her mother had been governing you know, her, how her feet were developing. You know, she was in, giving instructions that she must do her exercises for her arches. Um, and at another point, um, these uh, matrons of this holiday camp discovered that she had been secreting her used sanitary towels into her trunk. I was mortally embarrassed. And now, uh, I've, I've not had a mother-daughter relationship, but I, I know that back then, and to a great extent now, menstruation is the taboo subject. It's uncomfortable, it's personal for a lot of people. It's getting better. You know, finally, I, they stopped taxing sanitary products recently. Um, <laughs> yes, I, you know, so that, that, that does so a, a good direction of travel. But you'd imagine that the mother would go, when this happens, don't be scared. It's entirely natural. This is what we do. This is how we manage it. Um, and so, what was the response to all of this? Well, one, one of the matrons went, right, okay, I'm going to lock you in my room at night so you don't go walking. And the relationship between her and the matron got increasingly worse because Rosemary Kennedy kept on calling her cow. Where her name was Caroline and they, you know, her nickname was Carl, Car. But Rosemary Kennedy kept on calling her cow. Now, to me, that's exactly the kind of thing I do, you know, as a teenager, like, yeah, 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 <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it's, you, When you're oppressed so much, sometimes humour. And, and it was put down as a part of the medical diagnosis again. But nowhere can I find any evidence of a speech defect. Uh, the final point, you know, move was she had been moved to a convent school um, uh, in uh, Chicago, uh, and this is where the reform you spoke about of the Catholic Church, where there, there was uh, Thomas Werner Moore had said, "No, no, no, everybody's part of." of the flock, everybody deserves communion, etc. So it had brought scientists and clergy <laughs> together to create these spaces. Um, and what happened again? Well, she, she went out wandering at night, turning up. Uh, let's see if I can find that quote. Um, So Larson describes this period with uh, her outbursts burst of rage came on more frequently and unpredictably. Rose, Roses, the mother, niece, and uh, Gargan, the daughter of Rose's sister Agnes, revealed later that Rosemary had become incorrigible at St. Gertrude. She defied the nuns, the staff, and the rules. Many nights, Gargan told historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, the school would call to say she was missing, only to find her out walking about around the streets at 2 a.m. The nuns would bring her back, clean her up, put her to bed. Her explanations about where she'd been and what she'd been doing made no sense. Remember the Kennedy archive is closed. Or they made frightening sense. 
or they made frightening mm. sounds. Now, was, was this twin, you know, young 20-something going out to a jazz club where she was meeting other cultural dissidents and going, yeah, I'll have a drink. This music is great. Oh, wait, it's great to listen, you know, to be in conversation without some idiot hanging out with you. I looked up on that she was 23 when she had the operation. Uh, yes, so the, the, you know, this is the final part of the history where... Uh, thank you very much for coming, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Um, That's me. Uh, so, the, the decision, uh, and this is where the... the the terrible moment um, came about where they... So here's Ted. Teddy knew nothing, nothing of the dis difficulties of a big sister he was facing. He only knew that good Rosemary was his gentle friend. She was not rushing off on dates or off on, with her friends like his other big sisters. She was there ready to talk to him and play. To him, she was a dream of what an older sister could be. I only had the feeling of an older, a sweet, sweet older sister who was enormously cheerful, affectionate, loving, perhaps more so than some of the older ones. Um, so, it, it doesn't surprise me. I, I would be out, you know, having outbursts at if my life were like that. Um, and so at a certain point, at the age of 23, she, so it was the Solomon camp, I've covered this. Um, her parents, it, it was it's reported that Joe Senior took the unilateral decision to um, send her off to be lobotomized. And um, and it was reported that Rose, her mother, knew nothing of this. Um, and So this is uh, this is stressful. So please uh, be aware. At the age of twenty-three, uh, it was reported that her father sanctioned a lobotomy in order to pacify her mood swings and make her more compliant. She was threatened. He was threatened by the idea that scandal would affect his political career and those careers he had planned for his son, sons. The idea that there would be not be known as good Catholics was overwhelming to him. In 1941, unbeknownst to his family and uh, wife and family, Joe Kennedy took Rosemary to be examined by Dr. Walter Freeman, a neurologist and psychiatrist who was also a professor at George Washington University. Joe had read about their doctor's life, the successes in life, time, and Newsweek magazine. So media playing a, another role here. Uh, Dr. Freeman's diagnosis of Rosemary was agitated depression. He claimed lobotomy would not only relieve her of her, of her rages, she suffered, but also render her happy and content. The prestigious doctor, an imposing six feet tall, wore a professional looking moustache and beard, he assured Joe that the lobotomy was the best option for Rosemary. Uh, the following is an ex excerpt from Ronald Keeser's The Sins of the Father. Um, the lobotomy era had begun in the early 1930s when a pair of neurological scientists severed frontal lobes of chimpanzee brains, rendering them docile and relaxed. They presented their findings to a conference in 1935. Um, oh, can you just back a little bit? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, 
he returned to Lisbon, drilled holes in the skulls of 20 hopelessly ill mental patients. He reported most of them recovered or improved. Right. Dr. Walter J. Freeman, who had appointed to Elizabeth, Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, uh, read his reports and became an evangelist for the procedure. As a partner, he enlisted uh, his associate James W. Watts. In 1935, Freeman had invited Dr. Watts to join the neuro neurology department. Um, Born so just back there, sorry, so just back there that they had uh, the tests of chimpanzees. Yes. So, Originally chimpanzees, and then they, they experimented on 20 patients, human patients. And then presented the paper, and this got pro promoted through the press and the, the medical journalism. So, um, the, the very highly regarded doctors, and they published, um, and the statistics. So he, he, here's quite a traumatic passage. After Rosemary was mildly sedated, we went through the top of the skull, Dr. Watts recalled. I think she is awake. She had a mild tranquilizer. I made a surgical incision in the brain through the skull. It was near the front. It was on both sides. We just made a small incision, no more than an inch. The, the instrument Dr. Watts used looked like a butter knife. He swung it up and down to cut the brain tissue. We put an, inst the, an instrument aside, he said, inside. As Dr. Walter, Watts cut, Dr. Freeman asked Rosemary questions. For example, he would ask her to recite the Lord's Prayer or sing God Bless America or count backwards. <laughs> But that's a technique in brain surgery that's still used to know that if you're starting to damage things that right away you see they're losing some ability. I'm, so uh, it's, I think that's still a thing in brain surgery. I'm not, I'm not denying this. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, Sorry? You still see God bless America. Uh, some of us <laughs> don't, but yes. Her pulse became more rapid, her blood pressure rose. when. Uh, we made an estimate on how far to cut and how far how she responded. Dr. Watts, Watts said she began to become incoherent, they stopped. I would make in, the incisions and Dr. Freeman would estimate how much to cut as she talked. He talked to her, he would say that's enough. Beginning in 1946, Freeman and Watts refined their methods. Instead of cutting holes in the patient's skulls, they inserted a device that looked like an ice pick through the eye cavity. <laughs> Freeman, who has since died, later estimated that between 1936 and late 1950s, he performed supervised 4,000 of the 40,000 to 50,000 lobotomies performed in the United States. By the late 1950s, the lobotomy era had ended. Tranquilizers replaced the procedure. Dr. Watts told the author that, in his opinion, Rosemary had suffered not from mental retardation, but rather a form of depression. At the age of 90, he could not recall with certainty what kind of depression she had. Then, as now the terminology of psychiatric illness was constantly changing. So, and this final part of the article, I tune into Professor Gerald O'Brien's analysis of was this young woman a functional, intelligent individual? And uh, he was quoted in an article published in the Independent newspaper. I'm not convinced she was mentally disabled. Back then, mental retardation was not a clear category, and it wasn't judged in an, articulate, uh, an accurate way. The thing I read, it said it left her with no mental ability at the time. 
Uh, it, it's not not good. I looked at them though. Right. It, I mean, it, you know, it was designed to disrupt the functioning of the central nervous system. It, it wasn't designed. Part of it. Not all of it. It, it was designed to make her compliant. Yes, so I mean, she it, still could speak. She still could. How did they decide which part of the brain was the ear yeah, clearly? I, 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 frontal lobe has some particular functions at that time. I, I, I think there's something to do with. I, there was a there was somebody who worked in a uh, mining, and his job was to tamp dynamite. And when dynamite, which is nitroglycerin, we worked with clay to stabilize it. When dynamite's old, it bleeds the nitroglycerin, and nitroglycerin is highly unstable as an explosive. So if you drop a bottle of nitroglycerin on the floor, this whole place will go up. Whoa. When you mix it with clay, you can throw a stick of dynamite at the floor and it won't explode. When dynamite gets old, the nitroglycerin bleeds out and... It loses its moisture. One of the things about nitroglycerin is if you put it in water, you can just shake it around and do things. But once you uh, get all the water to evaporate from it, it's very volatile. So this guy whose job on, the, you know, you bore a hole in the rock and then you put a stick of dynamite down it and then you get an iron rod and tamp it down. You had a blasting cap on the, uh, in the stick of dynamite. Right. And then the fuse coming out. Well, and then you tamped around that because if you, you didn't have, if, if you kept the hole open, a lot of the explosion was just vented to the outside. So, so the, 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 the dynamite exploded and this rod passed through the, the head of this, this unfortunate guy. Now, it was a medical curiosity because he survived this with very significant damage to the, the frontal cortex, I think. And I think that might, that medical incident had something to do with this, these surgeons going, I'm not sure if the surgeon, that was the case of Phil H, who was the famous case with the thing that went straight through his stomach. People thought he should be dead because he went straight through the brain. But the interesting thing at that point was that they realised that you could actually do quite a lot of damage to the brain without killing somebody. Uh, and one of the things that happened to Phineas Gage was that his personality changed quite substantially afterwards yeah. as a result of that. He behaved quite differently. And I don't think that directly led to the idea of lobotomies, but they realised that you could actually do things with the brain that didn't kill people, but might produce other kinds of changes. But it was a very inexact science. And Phineas Gage, with the, through the skull, was hardly a good example of lobotomy. Norman Gay is an alone. He cut his car and a piece of wood went into his brain. And uh, and yet he was actually okay. I was extracting him. I don't think it changed him in any real way at all, apart from the whole story. Well, I remember Ray doing a talk about consciousness and where it's seated and, and shifting perspectives about the physicality. Um, to, to wrap this up, because uh, we're way over time, apologies, uh, you can go online and read through stuff. Do we know what she was like afterwards? Uh, yes. Uh, well, she, she had been significant, her, her cognitive function had been significantly diminished so that she couldn't manage her own life. She, she lost her independence. And it was deliberately done to, yeah, yeah, to to make her manageable. Uh, no longer these midnight walks. No longer uh, fits of rage. No longer, no no longer a lot of things. And I I see it as a human rights violation.
uh, as as is the reason why they don't do it now. Uh, it, it was ceased. Serious, safe home. Um, and I, tr- if if you go online, I try and pick through uh, in, in the last section of this the. Um, the notion of medical authority and its uh, how medicine has its authority partly because uh, the the power vested in uh, chosen people within a culture. Uh, I, I won't I won't go into that here because there's a whole other hour and a half. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate you all listening. Email's just going to